Whenever I see plants growing on a windowsill or on a city fire escape, I realize just how determined gardeners are to make things grow. That's right. By using house plants, you can create a garden almost anywhere. I'm Elliot Coleman. And I'm Barbara Damrosh. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll give you some tips on choosing plants for your indoor space. And we'll visit a marvelous indoor plant collection. On Gardening Naturally. Even people who have a yard full of plants outdoors still like to have a few plants indoors as well. That's because there's a great give and take between people and plants. We exhale carbon dioxide, they provide us with oxygen. I think we're meant to be together. They give off humidity too, which is also something we need in overheated dry winter rooms. And studies have shown that plants are very effective at doing away with indoor air pollution because they filter the air. They're also beautiful to look at. They're a living decoration. <laughs> With the emphasis on living, and that's the nice thing about them. Plants require you to nurture and care for them. They're completely dependent on you. They don't get rained on the way they would outdoors. So you have to really tune yourself to each plant's watering needs. Like this streptocarpus. It likes to dry out a little between waterings. Other plants might not. When a plant is over your head like this one, you can often forget to water it. And that's where this wonderful squeeze bottle is so useful. I used to balance precariously on a chair. Now I can just reach up here with this curved neck, squeeze the bottle, and I've successfully watered the plant. And there are some plants that like to be misted. For instance, these tillandsias, the little epiphytes that grow high up in jungle trees and catch all of their nutrients from rainwater. And what I do is I come along and mist them with this spray bottle every day or two, and that's all the watering that they need. But like everything else in gardening, remember to practice moderation. I suspect more house plants have been killed by overwatering than any other way. My mother is a great gardener, and I wanted to do something really special for her birthday this summer. So I got her this beautiful English pot, and I'm going to fill it with lovely things. Now, the first thing we have to contend with with this pot is it has a very large hole in the bottom for drainage. And if I'm going to put soil in there, well, soil's going to all run out. So what I've done is I've found a nice flat rock that'll just fit down there in the bottom and cover the hole, but still let water drain out. Next thing I'm going to do is take some crushed rock like this and fill in there for some extra drainage like that. And then I'm going to take a piece of this floating row cover that I cut in a circle about the size of the bottom of the pot and lay it over the rocks so that when I put my soil in, it's not going to all run out the bottom. Okay, next step is to fill this up with soil. Okay, that should do it. Just full enough, but about an inch of space left to water. There's a nice, light, rich peat mix with plenty of compost in it. Okay, now for the fun part. My mother loves to have some edibles inside during the long winter, so I bought her a little lemon tree. This is a ponderosa lemon, which produces enormous lemons, almost as big as small grapefruits. I'm going to plant that right in the middle there. Now, as this lemon tree grows over the next few years, it will probably take up the whole pot, but for now, it looks a little bit lonely, so I'm going to give her some other things as well. Now, here's some nice golden sage, which she can use in cooking, but it's also got that lovely yellow edge, and I think it'll look very handsome in here. Now, maybe I'll put one of those and something else yellow, like this yellow portulaca, sort of trailing over here. I think that would look nice. And maybe another of those over here. And here's another edible thing. This is
Barbara and I are here at the University of Maine in Orono, and behind us are the Roger Clapp greenhouses. We're here to meet with Lois Stack, who's the horticulture specialist with the Cooperative Extension. Hi, Lois. Welcome to campus. Thank you. I'm going to get a tour of the greenhouses with Lois. I'm going to meet you back here in a little bit. I have to get a book from the library. See you later. Barbara, what would you like to see first? I'd like to start with some plants that are very easy to grow, very adaptable, that the beginner could start with if they haven't tried house plants before. Oh, I have just the group of plants you're looking for, the aeroids. Let's well, get started. On to the aeroids. It's like a jungle in here, Lois. It is a little steamy, isn't it? Yeah, it's wonderful, though. You know, aroid is not exactly a household word. Is this a large group of plants? Well, the word aroid not, may not be quite so common, but the family is very common. In fact, here's the most populous member. This is the philodendron, and this is a plant that grows up trees. But we have lots of philodendrons that are popular houseplants. Mm -hmm. That's right. If you've only heard of one houseplant, you've probably heard of a philodendron. Absolutely. And this is probably the one you've heard of. This is the Hartley philodendron. I think the most popular mm -hmm. plant as a houseplant in the country. Sure. But this one here doesn't seem all that common with a Swiss cheese holes. That's really exotic looking. It is a little different. It's called the split leaf philodendron. It's popular because of that texture. Yeah. Now, I noticed that you've got all of these growing in a greenhouse with shade cloth over the top. Is that because they like low light? Absolutely. These are members of, of the tropical rainforest where it's really quite dark in right. the understory. So we've put up a black shade cloth to protect them from the sun. Well, now that must make them good house plants because in the house, that's the worst problem you have, not enough light. Exactly. I think light is the most limiting factor for house plants. And if you're going to start with a house plant, I think the aeroid family is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, do they have any special requirements? Not really. They're adaptable to our home conditions. They don't need any special fertilizer or water or humidity, just mm -hmm. very basic care. Well, now this one must do well indoors because I see it in banks, I see it in hotels, I see it in stores. This one has become quite popular. It's the spath or spathophyllum. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it even flowers every year. And it has the typical aeroid flower with a, a leaf and a, a pointed part. This is the spath and spadix. So you can always tell a philodendron family member mm -hmm. because of that flower. And in fact, this one will flower even in your home. Wow. And this is another one I see all over the place, too. What's that? This is one you've probably seen as a ground cover in the plantings at shopping malls. It's the Chinese evergreen or aglaonema. Uh -huh. So it's the shopping mall plant. Exactly. And, and the flowers are not as conspicuous as this one, but it has such interesting leaves that it makes up for it. Exactly. This is a plant that we value because it has lots of colors in its yeah. leaves. Yeah. Now, I noticed that you've got ferns growing here in the same place. Is that because they like the shaded greenhouse, too? Absolutely. Ferns and philodendrons both belong in low-light conditions. Mm -hmm. But I haven't had as good luck with ferns as I've had with some of these. I'm not surprised. They take a lot of humidity, and that's uh, hard to do in a home. Now, here in the greenhouse, you can see that our benches have pebbles on them. Mm -hmm. and there's always a little water from the irrigation, and that water evaporates up and keeps the ferns happy. Well, I bet you could duplicate that in the home, though. You could take a big tray and, and fill it with pebbles and just set the pots right on the pebbles with a low level of water underneath. Right. And, in fact, you'd get double duty off that because you'd have water evaporating from the pebbles, and the plants as a group would give off water to help each other. Oh, so you, they'd create their own little mini jungle. Absolutely. That's great. Um, this is a particularly lovely fern, Lois. Is this easy to grow? It is a beauty. This is a fern that's quite easy to grow. It's a good one for the house. The reason I'm peering in here is that it has little furry feet. Yes, those are the rhizomes, and we call those rabbit's feet and the fern is called the rabbit's foot fern. Oh, that is really, really fun. Now, this one over here, you've been telling me that everything here is tropical, but this looks exactly like the maidenhair fern that's native to the New England woods. Excellent. This is a maidenhair fern, but this particular one is native to the tropics, which is what makes it such a good house plant. Oh, I see. Now, there's another group of plants I'd like to show you up ahead. They're also tropical, but they don't require the humidity, and they're very easy to manage. Oh, well, I'd like to see that. Great. Barbara, this is a great group of house plants. These are the bromeliads, or vase plants, and you can see why they're called vase plants. Their leaves point upward and form a vase. Sure. They're beautiful, aren't they? They're all different. Oh, they are. They're just an extraordinary group of plants. 
Now in the tropical rainforest where they're native, they're epiphytes, which means they live on top of other plants, just as this one is mounted on top of a piece of driftwood. And their roots are used just to hold on to the tree, mm -hmm. but they get all of their rain and nutrients from above. So that fills up the base and keeps the plant alive. So they're collecting rain and also litter that falls from the trees. Exactly. And they get organic matter from that. But how do you duplicate that in the home, the nutrients? Well, it would be hard to do exactly that in the home, but you can take a standard fertilizer, put it in water, dilute it mm -hmm. to about one quarter or one half strength, and feed either the roots or the base. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed that they have different flowers from one another, too, like this one. Is that a flower cluster or the fruit that follows it? Well, that's a fruit cluster. Some of the flowers are up high and some are down low, and then the fruits follow. And all of them are just exquisite colors, often mm. mixtures of orange and pink and purple and green. Mm -hmm. Quite odd. Well, now, that one's very striking, but some of them you have to look closely. Now, that one there, the flowers are deep inside the vase, and they're those beautiful little lavender ones. Yeah, you really have to get a close look to appreciate the flowers on that one. And almost all the bromeliads have this base shape except for one exception that I can think of, and it's one that a lot of people are probably familiar with. This is Spanish moss. Sure, but that's a bromeliad? It is. It's not a moss at all. It's really a bromeliad. Oh. Yeah. Well, now, apart from keeping their vases filled with water and some fertilizer, do they have any other special requirements? Are they easy to grow? I think they're very easy to grow. They're native to an area where they are warm mm -hmm. and humid and well-watered but they're very adaptable to our homes where it's still warm, but they're easily watered either regularly or irregularly, mm. and their nutrient requirements are quite low. And what about the humidity if your home isn't humid? They adapt extraordinarily well. I'm very impressed with this group of plants. It's a good group of house plants. Sounds like a good easy one for me. It is, and since it takes warm conditions, it does well in our homes. Right. Now there's another group of plants that does well in a warm home, and that I think is pretty interesting. I'd like to show you that as well. Sure. the house plant gets too big for its pot and we're going to show you what to do about that. Now this Diffenbachia is one we strongly suspect has reached that state of affairs. Absolutely. Our first clue is looking at those stems. You can see how crowded they are. And the second clue is tipping the plant out of its pot. If we can get it out, we'll notice that the, the roots... Oh, look at that. It is root bound. Now the first thing that we want to do is get rid of all of these roots on the bottom that are so close together there isn't even any potting mix between them and they're pretty dysfunctional. So I'm just going to slice off that bottom half inch or so of the plant. And you can see that it's just roots. Mm -hmm. So we'll discard that. Now we have two choices. If we like the way this plant looks, nice and bushy and many stems, then we can just pot it up. That means putting it into a pot that's about one inch bigger all the way around mm -hmm. than the original pot. If we were going to do that, I would take the root system and slice with a knife right through the root ball about an inch in, three or four places around the root ball to open it up. This cut severs the roots and allows a lot more branching and we get a vigorous root system right away. Mm -hmm. I would work out as much of the soil as I could from this root system, put some soil into the bottom mm -hmm. of the pot, set this in at the same level as it was growing and firm the mix around it. Right. And we'd be all done. And what's our other choice? Well, the other choice is the one that I would choose for this plant because I really think that it's way too crowded. Some of the leaves are falling off the bottoms of the branches mm -hmm. and I think it would be better divided. That's the same process that we do with perennials out in the flower right. garden. It's very simple and straightforward. We take a look at the plant and find a natural division among those stems and just slide the knife through it and cut right down through the root system. Now we can keep making cuts as long as we can keep finding those natural divisions in the clump and out of this plant I might expect to make maybe three or four or even five new plants. So while you pop that up, Barbara, I'm just going to keep cutting. Well, how about this cute little group of plants? Aren't these wonderful? These are all peperonias, and I think peperonia is just a great group of plants to collect. Mm -hmm. In the home, many people get to a point with house plants where they want to know more, and once they know more, they want to have a, a collection of plants mm -hmm. that kind of fit together. For example, orchids or begonias, and this, I think, is a good group to collect. 
Well, for one thing, it stays so small. That's exactly right. All of the peperomias are small. A few of them go in hanging baskets, but most mm -hmm. of them are upright. They all fit in a couple of windowsills, and, and they're easy to take care of. But they're also different. I mean, this one has upright maroon leaves, and this one is dark and crinkly green. That's right. That's the uh, emerald ripple peperomia. It's a very popular one. Mm -hmm. This one with kind of bluish silver leaves is the watermelon peperomia. Uh, this one has a little knob-like leaves. They're all quite mm. different. And this one, looking at this one, it almost looks like pea pods. Isn't that unusual? Those are actually the leaves, and this is a plant that evolved over thousands and thousands of years in a mm. location where there was very, very high light. And over time, the leaves actually folded up, and that green stripe that you see along the top, that's like a window that allows the sun in. Wow. So botanically, this is a very interesting group, too. It is. They're, oh. they're a great group of plant, very interesting to read about and to grow. Well, I notice the flowers are all the same on every plant. They're these little skinny wands. Yes, they are all the same. And in fact, since these plants are all in the same genus, Peperomia, the flowers, mm -hmm. of course, are all the same. So you can look from one plant to another, and you can really tell, you can really pick out the Peperomias in a mm -hmm. collection. Well, now, do you have any special tricks for growing Peperomias? Peperomias are one of the easiest groups to grow. They prefer high light, but they will take medium light. Mm -hmm. They don't need high humidity. They're quite close in culture to the cacti and succulents, so they do well in a dry home. And if anything, the one problem that these plants sometimes experience is that we take good, too good care of them and we overwater them. So they should be yeah. kept on the dry side. Yeah, that's a common problem, isn't it? Overwatering houseplants. It is, but you know, we have some great plants for dry locations and some of them are our best houseplants. I found the book I was looking for at the library. It's a history of greenhouses, and it explains why people have so long been fascinated by glass buildings. And one reason is that you can grow plants like this. This is called a sensitive plant, and if you want to get your kids interested in horticulture, if you had one of these in the greenhouse, you'd almost guarantee it. The beauty of this is that when you touch the leaf of a sensitive plant, it reacts. It immediately sort of curls up like that. Now, it does that for very good reasons. There are theories that this may be a way to prevent moisture loss in a hot, windy climate, or maybe to protect it against predators so so much won't get eaten. But either way, it is a delightful plant to have and an endless fascination to children. Lois, this is a delightful little cactus garden. Oh, thanks, Barbara. We had such a big collection of cacti and succulents that we decided to plant some of them out in this bed to show people what they might look like in their native habitat. Well, it's very successful. And it looks like Elliot's discovered it, too. Oh, hi, Elliot. Hi, Lois. Hi, Barbara. You know, this is such a perfect example of how nature has plants for every condition. I would hate to grow vegetables in a soil like this, but these guys love it. So you must have to modify a potting soil to get them to grow well. Is that right? We do. I usually start with a standard potting mix and take two parts of that mix and mix it with one part of coarse sand. And I find that that's a pretty good estimate of, of what a cactus would need. And that gets you better drainage in the mix and a nice desert look on top. Exactly. Well, speaking of desert, I should think that being desert plants, they would need a lot less water than those house plants, too. Can you give me any rule of thumb? There is a good rule of thumb. During the spring and summer, I water about every two weeks. And when I water, I water thoroughly so that the water runs out the bottom of the pot. Mm -hmm. In the fall and winter, I cut the frequency back about by half so that I'm watering only every three or even four weeks. And I find that not only do I get better plants, but I get better flowering in the spring. Makes well, sense. They certainly look healthy. And by the way, I've wandered around the greenhouse, and every plant in here is a picture of health and vigor with almost no pest problems. Well, thanks. Now, that's a pretty good job. Do you have a secret for doing that? Well, I have two secrets, and, and I hope they're not big secrets because I think they're good rules. The first one is to look at the environment in terms of light, temperature, water, humidity, nutrients, and determine what that place has to offer and pick the right plant for the right place. And second, when I go out to buy a plant, I try to choose the most healthy, well-grown, thrifty plant that I could find. And I find that if I follow just those two rules, the pest problems are minimal. Well, that certainly agrees with our experience. Start with a healthy plant and give it the conditions it likes. Lois, I have thoroughly enjoyed this tour. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barbara. I've enjoyed having you here. <laughs> Thanks from all of us. For now, goodbye and good gardening.
Next on TLC, get started on easy home projects that anyone can handle here on Homebodies. Then indulge your creative side with Debbie Stapley on Crafts & Company here on TLC.